Okay then, welcome once more. We have David de la Basse from Oracle here with us. Uh, he will be your speaker for the next uh, half an hour or a little more. You can also find him like other speakers after the session for a brief Q&A uh, over there on Heap Space Booth. Uh, David will be uh, happy to answer to all your questions and maybe share some of his passion for arcade games, pinball and other uh, and video games also. So thank you. See you later. Thanks. Am I on? Can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah. Okay, good. So first of all, uh, good morning. Yes, we're still in the morning. So thanks for coming to this session in which we'll discuss uh, serverless Java. So the goal of this section is basically to look at Java in the serverless space. Um, if we look today um, in the serverless space, most of the time, JavaScript is being used. Java, despite the fact that it's one of the most popular lang programming language, is not yet widely used in that space. So I'm going to give you one of the op options that uh, you can use to use Java within that space. So before we do that, I just want to introduce myself very quickly. So my name is David Delabasse. You can find me on Twitter at Delabasse. Uh, I work at Oracle. Um, technically, I'm based in Belgium, so I'm reporting to uh, HQ in the US, but I'm based uh, in Belgium. So I just want to give you a very short... Sorry. I just want to give you a one-minute overview of Belgium, because Belgium is a very small country. So that's basically a teeny country that is stuck between France and Germany. I think in terms of size, it's three times more, smaller than Serbia, just to give you an idea. Uh, it's a very small country, but we do have one thing that is very famous in Belgium, that's the Belgian cuisine. So what do we have in terms of food in Belgium? First of all, we have Belgian beers. Over 1,600 different types of beer. Uh, and in fact, the UNESCO, so the United Nations, have put the Belgian beer on their, on their cultural heritage list. So that's something that, that is quite uh, important. Then we have Belgian chocolate. We produce over 20, 22 kilograms of chocolate per inhabitant per year. That's another thing that we have in the Belgian cuisine. Then there's this. Anybody has a guess what this is? Yeah, I heard French fries. That is not French fries, that is indeed Belgian fries. So there is an ongoing battle between France and Belgium about the ownerships of fries. And clearly, fries have been invented in Belgium. And if you trust me, uh, just go on the Wikipedia page of fries, if you happen to have a lot of time. There is a whole section about that ongoing battle, and you will see that clearly we have all the arguments on our side to prove that fries are coming from Belgium and not from France. And finally, there's this in the Belgian cuisine, the Brussels sprout. Anybody enjoy the Brussels sprout? Oh, two hands. I'm really sorry for you. And well, let me show you a secret. That's my own theory, but I'm pretty sure that is accurate. Brussels sprouts are not coming from Brussels nor from Belgium, but they are coming from France. <laughs> so finally, Belgium is also called the land of surrealism. And just to prove that, if you happen to take Brussels Airline, which is the national airline in Belgium, we do serve fries uh, during the flights. And if you look closely, you will again have the confirmation that fries are coming from Belgium and not from France. OK, enough about Belgium and its very nice cuisine. Let's discuss serverless and fast function as a services. So first, I will give you some context, and then we will uh, have some hands-on to see exactly how it works. So first of all, within, this as a, within the fast as a services uh, platform, we have this notion of a function. A function is basically a well-bonded piece of code that will perform one task. It gets something in input, it will perform something based on the output, and it, it will produce most of the time an output. Um, so we have this notion of a very well-scoped piece of meaning that the function will basically perform just one task. So that, that basically means that you, it's easy to write, it's easy to understand, and hence it's easy to maintain. Sex, function should also be uh, stateless it will give us the ability to easily scale. So basically, a function is a small piece of code that is ephemeral. It will be invoked, it will perform its task, and then it will die. And obviously, we will have a bunch of functions. We will have, obviously, a lot of functions. Now, something which is important to keep in mind, it's not a function as we have in mathematics in the sense that a function can also have some side effects, like, for example, putting something in a queue or in a key value store. 
that's one of the expected side effects that we might have with, with, with function. Then we have this as a service piece. The as a service piece is basically the compute element on which your function will run. So you, as a user, will write function and you will deploy function on a fast platform. Now, when it comes to a fast platform, we can easily distinguish two roles. The fast users, typically you, who will write function, and then there's the fast platform provider. And the role of the fast platform provider is basically to do all the dirty jobs of making sure that everything works fine. That includes provisioning the platform to cope with the, with the load. That includes managing the platform. That includes making sure that everything is, is patched at the right level, and so on and so on. So that's one of the core ideas. We have these two different roles, and typically most of the time you will, spend, you will be the fast platform users. Now, why, do you, why would you want to go towards the serverless model? Well, one of the things is that there's no server, but clearly there are a bunch of servers, but it's happened to be someone else's server. So you will use someone else's server, and the management, the operation of all those servers is basically handled by someone else. So you as a user can easily focus on writing code for your function and nothing more. So that's one of the benefits. Given that, you will be uh, able to more to basically more easily uh, iterate within your function. So you write your function more easily, you can deploy them as you go, you can test them very easily, and so on. You don't have to, to handle and deal with all the operation aspect of uh, making sure that your function runs. Now, given that functions are most of the time stateless, um, it, your function will also be able to scale more easily. And the idea is that the, the, the underlying platform shouldn't be exposed within your function. But Given that your function doesn't hold within the function itself any state, I mean, if it has to do that, the state should be uh, stored outside of the function, you will be able to more easily scale your function. So that's one of the benefits. And given that, the fast platform provider will also have the ability to basically increase the density. So it will be able to uh, basically host more function within a given environment. So that also means that from, from an economical point of view, uh, serverless also provides some uh, nice benefits. Like, if the fast platform provider is able to increase the density, obviously it should make some savings that should be reflected on what you will pay at the, other, at the end of the month. One of the ideas also is that if your function doesn't run, if your function doesn't consume any resources, your function, you shouldn't be built, basically. Now, if your function is heavily invoked, obviously then you will have to pay. But we can assume that if your functions are invoked a lot, that also means that you are basically doing some business. So it, it makes sense on that front. So now I will um, discuss about FN Project, which is a new open source fast platform that Oracle is contributing on. It's pretty young. I mean, it's not even one year old. We have announced it um, basically last year at Java 1. GitHub.com slash FN Project. Everything is in there. So when we started at Oracle to think about what can we do within the fast space, we set, our, we set ourselves some goals. So first, we want to get some traction. So if we want to get some traction with our uh, fast platform, we need to make sure that developers are using it. One way we can achieve that is, that is by being open source. Being open source provide us, provide sorry, the community multiple benefits, including the fact that there is no locking to any vendors, including Oracle. Um, we also wanted the platform to be very approachable. So you will see that you can very easily get started with FN. You can install it on your machine. Everything is open source. You can very easily create function, and you can easily uh, continue to work with the platform. Now, the fact that the platform is very approachable doesn't preclude you from doing more advanced stuff. That's something that we will see uh, during one of the demo. So we have these two angles. We want the platform to be very easy, but we don't want the platform to handle and hide everything uh, for you. Advanced users still have the ability to see what's going on. We also decided from the beginning that the platform should be container-based. Uh, you will see that it, this provides many benefits, including um, the ability to support multiple languages. So, FN is a language basically independent. So out of the box, we do support a bunch of language. Today, I'm going to discuss only about Java, but we're also supporting other language because under the hood, we are using containers. Technically, FN is independent of the scheduler. So if you look closely, you will see that 
Oracle has made the choice to use Kubernetes, but there's nothing that precludes you from deploying uh, FN on a different scheduler than Kubernetes. It's language independent, I've already mentioned that, and last but not least, it's also platform independent. Everything is open source in the GitHub organization, so you can take FN, you can install it on your laptop. That's something that is very convenient for development, or for doing demos, or for doing some uh, proof of concept. Um, you can also take FN and run it on premises, so within your own data center. Obviously, if you are doing that, you will lose one of the benefits uh, of a fast platform, in the sense that you will basically have to deal with the two roles. So you will be the fast platform users, and someone in the company will, will also have to manage the fast platform. But if you understand that, that's a perfectly uh, possible solution. And there are clearly use cases where that makes sense. For example, some legislation prevent you from prevent the data from leaving a given country or a given uh, geography. For that, if you have such a requirement, you can take FN and run it on premises. And obviously, most of the time, you will use a managed version of FN. So basically, FN in the cloud. Oracle will have at some point in time uh, Oracle function, which is a managed uh, version on FN. So we will have a managed services that you can buy if you want um, to use FN within the cloud. But what we might also see is different cloud provider Given that everything is open source, they can take FN and provide their own managed services based on FN. That's something that might happen. That's the beauty of open source. So if we look at the function in FN, basically a function is a, is a container. So the container will get some output through STD in. It will perform uh, a job based on the input, and it will produce an output STD out. So everything is wrapped. So the code of your function is wrapped into a Docker containers. And if you don't want to deal with STD in, STD out, you can use one of the FDK, one of the function development kit that is created by FN. And you will see that today I'm going to use the Java FDK. So the, FGK, the, F, the FDK is basically hiding some of the STD in, STD out uh, stuff. But it also provides other capability that, we will, that we, we will discover later on. So just remember that. In FN, you take your code, and it's auto automatically wrapped as a Docker image container. You don't have to uh, deal with Docker itself. Every, everything is handled by the FN tooling. Now, if we look at the typical architecture that we have in FN, we have FN server. You need at least once. Here, I'm using FN server running on my, my machine, but I also have remote FN server running in the cloud. Obviously, if you want to scale, you will need multiple FN server. If you have multiple FN server, you need to have a smart load balancer in front of that. So that's one of the components that we're also providing in the GitHub repo. So the load balancer is basically doing a smart request routing. So if, let's say, we have a container that is ready to deal with that given uh, function, if we have an incoming request for that function, it might be wise to route that request to that given container, those kind of things. But you, as a user, doesn't necessarily need to understand the architecture. Just keep in mind that we have FN server, and you can run FN server on your machine for development purposes. You, as a user, will typically use the CLI. So FN provides a command line tool that you can use to basically do everything. So it's really your gateway entry as a user to, the, to FN. And you will see through the demo today that I'm using the CLI. And also, as a user, as I already mentioned, you might want to consider using one of the FDK that we are providing. The Java FDK, uh, or the Go FDK, or the Node FDK. Basically, the idea is that we want FN to be very uh, much developer friendly. So that's why we are providing those FDK. They are basically giving a, an abstraction uh, on top of uh, FN. So technically, FN is written in Go. So that means that you can write Go function. But again, if we want to be developer friendly, if you, have a, if you are a Java developer, we will not ask you to write Go function. You want to keep using what you are using today. So you will I likely use a Java to write your function. So let's have a look. So I have FN running here. So I'm going to use uh, the CLI to bootstrap a function. So FN run FN init. And I, will, um, I want to use the Java runtime, given that I want to produce a Java function. I will give my function a name, Duke. This basically creates some boilerplates for my Java function. If we look what we have here, we have a few files, including a fang.yaml 
and a pom.xml. So basically, the Java function is basically just a Maven project. So given that it's a Maven project, again, I can continue to use um, my tool, so I'm, I can open my function within my ID. So what we are here. So we have the func.yaml. So the func.yaml is basically a file that contains some metadata regarding the function. So for example, this is the name of the function. This is the version of the function. This is the runtime that we want to use. Um, here we are using two images for the function. The first one is used to build. It's a, it's a Docker image that will be used to build uh, the image that will run my function. The second one is the run image. So the run image is basically an image that will uh, be used to run my, um, my function, knowing that we are using Docker multiple layers for that. So it's basically an optimized uh, image for running Java function. This is the entry point of my function, so come example like, and so on and so on. So basically, this function is a simple LOL function that you can use to uh, kickstart your code. So if we look at the function itself, So this is funny. Just checking because there is a class that shouldn't be there. That's strange. I think my, uh, my, um, I have some issue with uh, IntelliJ here. So anyway, this is the class. Of, this is my function. Uh, you see that the function is pretty basic. It's a simple LOL. But what you can also notice is that there's nothing specific in FN within the function. So there's no interface, uh, there's, but it's basically plain old Java. So we have one class with one method, handle request. This is our serverless function. Uh, in this case, it gets a string in input, and it will produce uh, some output as a string type. So this guy shouldn't be there, so let's remove it. Um, we also have this. We have another class for the function. And that's basically a GUnit Arnett test that is automatically generated for the function. So that's something that we can use to test the function. So let's see that. Uh, let's see, a Maven test. So here my function uh, is tested. So it works. I haven't changed anything. So that makes sense that it works. So what I can do, I can uh, deploy my function. So uh, fn deploy. I need to deploy my function within an app. So let's call the app bel, uh, beg for Belgrade. And I need to specify which function. So that would be Duke. But given that I'm in the Duke directory, I don't have to specify that. So my function has been deployed. So now if I do an fn li list, and if I look at uh, let's see, I want to list the function within the, it was the big app, I think. I have one function. So this is the function that I've just deployed. Now I can look at my function. So first I can invoke my function. So if I invoke um, uh, the app, beg, and the function itself, duke. So it's invoked. Um, you, well, maybe you didn't notice, but the first time, so when I did that, the first invocation was a little bit slow. Why? Because basically the FN server has to bootstrap a container to serve my function. But the next time I'm invoking my function, I still have that container running. So now you will see that invoking my function basically takes around, it's a Java function, so it takes around 100 milliseconds, which is uh, quite good. Um, what I can also do, I can inspect my function. So in fact, inspect beg duke. And what I have here is an HTTP endpoint that I can use. So in FN, we have triggers. Trigger is basically used to invoke a function. By default, we have an HTTP triggers. But we can imagine to have different types of triggers, like an MQ triggers, an MQTT triggers, or a scheduler triggers, and so on. Here, given that I have an HTTP triggers, I have an HTTP endpoint that I can use to invoke my function. So if I curl that, I, will, I should basically have the same result. You see? So the thing here is that I'm using FN locally running on my machine. That's very convenient for development. But obviously, at the end of the day, you want to deploy your function within the cloud. 
So for that, I need to switch context. Uh, and I always forget the comment. So I think it's FN use context. Yes. So now I'm using the Oracle Cloud context. So I can uh, deploy my function again. It will take a little bit, a little, little bit of time, because this time I have to push my function to my uh, Docker registry. So, and we are quite good with the, with the networks. So now I can invoke my, invoke my function again, so the same way, in fn invoke, uh, that's the beg duke function, but this time I will uh, time it to see. So again, this is a remote fn server, so it takes a bit of time. We are going through the network, it has to fetch the image for the registry and so on. It's, well, so we basically save like one second. So let's look at the function again. So fn split. So this time we see that indeed the function is not running on local host anymore, but it's running on my uh, remote fn server. So fn minus x post, and I should get the same result. So this is basically how it works. So you are using the FNCLI to bootstrap the function, but you are also using the FNCLI to deploy your function, to switch context, and so on. So let's go back to the default context. OK. So now I'm running, I will deploy against a local FN server. So if we go back to the function, uh, we see, for example, that this function uh, is pretty basic. It gets a string, and it, it will produce a string. So what we can do is this. So let's create a new Java class. So uh, so person person as a last name and a first name constructor also need a default constructor and so again, this is, this is a s simple POJO. There's nothing specific to FN here, and neither in uh, the function itself. So now I have this person type. I can say, for example, then in, in my input, it instead of being a string type, would be a person, right? So that means that I can work with the person. So instead of saying hello name, I can say, for example, input uh, get first name. So I say input get first name. So now my function is expecting to get some uh, person object in input, so that means that I have basically to provide that. For that, I'm going to use JSON. So I'm creating some JSON document for a person type. And we say that a person has a last name, and it has a first name. I will zoom in so that you can see. This is super thin. So it's here. So this is the, the, the document that I will send to my uh, function. So now if I do that, and if I first I need to deploy my function, so let's make sure that I, sorry. I saved it, this function and that I've deployed it. So you see that the version has been increased to version 4, and under the hood, the FNCLI is building the image. Uh, it fails. Anybody has a guess why it failed? So we are seeing that indeed we are using Docker under the hood. It failed basically, we, are, we still have the test. And I haven't fixed my test. So it really makes sense that it failed. So to fix the test, I can do that. Most of the time when I do that, people complain that this is not the proper way to do. So that is the other way. Now, don't do this at home. This is just for a demo, right? 
So now um, I can deploy my function, and it, hopefully it shouldn't it shouldn't fail. So uh, oops, let's see. Takes a bit of time because I have to fetch the dependency. So, succeed. So now, no test failure. So we're good. So uh, the function has been updated. So we can now invoke the function again, but this time I will pass it some payload. So fn invoke. The function is still uh, in the beg application and it's still called Duke. And let's see. And let's let's time it to see. Uh, let's not time it. Um, an exception was thrown during input correction. So what did I pass? Last the lava safe for oh uh, my my JSON looks okay. So uh, person input. Uh, let's look at the type string last first. Um, person. What? Sorry? I, I so let's see. Uh, good catch. Thank you. So uh, let's try again and let's time it. Well, it's already been built, so we won't see much difference. So you see, this is the result of the function. So, hello, David, right? Now let's invoke it again. It should be faster, 95 milliseconds. So go back here. So again, you see that using, so basically input and output coercion from JSON to JSON from, well, from JSON to Java and uh, from Java to JSON is something that is handled automatically by the FDK. So here I didn't have to do anything specific. That's one of the uh, capabilities that's provided by the FDK. Maven support is also provided by the FDK. You see here that I don't have to deal with yesterday in, yesterday out. This is something that is provided by the FDK. Uh, the fact that we have GUnit support is also provi provided by the FDK. And obviously here I'm just getting person type in input, but if I want, I can also um, use person type in output. So obviously I need to change uh, my signature then. And let's say that, for example, we just want to, um, uh, let's see. We just want to uh, hide, for example, the first name of the person. So let's deploy the function again. Let's, yeps. And let's invoke it again. So we are still passing JSON. Oops, sorry. But this time, we get a JSON output uh, in addition to the JSON input. So again, you see that the FDK basically allows us to just write plain old Java code. We don't have to deal with any of the underlying uh, capability of the platform. Everything is basically abstracted away from us by the FDK. So that's something that is provided by the, uh, the FDK. Obviously, given that it's a Maven project, I can, for example, in, uh, import any Maven dependency if I need to. Those kind of things are perfectly possible uh, with FN. So let's go back to the slides. So in FN, we obviously have very good Java support. But it's not only Java. I mean, if you are Go developers, you can write function in Go. In fact, we support Go, Python, JavaScript, and Ruby, in addition to Java, out of the box. But the landscape is evolving. So if we just look at Java, for example, every six months, we have a new Java release. So that doesn't mean that FN has to cope with, the, with that. And in the Java space, there's more than just the Java language. There, there are other languages like uh, Kotlin, uh, Groovy, and so on, and so on. Then there's other uh, solution coming from that space too, like Graal, for example. 
So what we realize is that if we want to have a solution that is very open, we need to provide the hooks that allows one to easily add support for, uh, for, for new stuff coming from the ecosystem. And this is now achieved using a capability that is called init image. So basically, the only thing that you need to provide if you want to add support for a new language in FN, you just provide FN a Docker image that will uh, provide all the bootstrapping, all the, all the bootstrapping for that given, let's say, language, for example. So to do that, you need to know a little bit of Docker, and you obviously need to know that programming language. So basically, how to make from the source code a runnable artifact. So that's something that we are starting to use in FN ourselves. And for example, what I did uh, some time ago, I've had it uh, support for Kotlin in FN. So in FN, today, you can write Kotlin function. You just need to switch to a different runtime, Kotlin. And if you look at the Kotlin function, so basically, we, we still have two class the hello world class that will get you started to write your function and we also have a testing class so if we look at those two files yeah i'm not in the right directory So this is a Kotlin function. This is basically the same code. So it's still an hello world function, uh, but this time it's written using Kotlin. And if you go here, we also have the test for that function. And obviously those tests are written using Kotlin 2, uh, using that specific GUnit mo uh, Kotlin module that I forgot the name. So now if you fn deploy uh, local So you can now deploy the cut-in function. Uh, and if everything went well, you can invoke it too. So if an invoke, uh, the function is called Kota, I think. And this is the hello world, but this time coming from Kotlin. It works exactly the same way. What I can do, obviously, I can pipe in some payload. Uh, and this time we want to invoke the Kotlin function. And you see that uh, it works. So basically here, we are providing a bunch of language that you can use to write your function. But given that everything in FN is a container, you can also provide your own language, or you can also take an existing application that supports STD in STD out and wrap it as a function. That, and, and then you can deploy and use it as a function. So FN is not just Java or what we provide within uh, the framework itself. Now, at the beginning, I told you that we want the, station, the, the function to be stateless. So if you want to hold some state within the, fa the, the function, don't do that. Do it outside of the function itself. Having said that, there are very specific uh, use cases where it makes sense to hold the state within a function. And that's typically when you have a function that will have to invoke other functions. So just imagine this. We have a function that will invoke another function. It will get the result from that invocation. Based on that, the main function will maybe trigger another function, and so on and so on. In such a case, then the main function will have to hold some states. And we have added within the FDK an API to do that. That's the flow API. It's very similar to the completion stage API that we have in Java IC. So the Compression Stage API is this API that allows you to basically chain together multiple asynchronous tasks. So through the API, you trigger an asynchronous task execution, and you can, using the same API, tell, OK, when this task is done, I want to trigger, for example, that other task. This is the same idea, except that here we are not talking about asynchronous task execution within a process, but we are talking about uh, serverless function. So they will I likely run outside of the process that is invoking them. So it's basically a distributed safe uh, complete, complete, completion stage API like uh, for a function. So to illustrate this, I have this uh, very basic demo. So it's the typical travel booking scenario where I want to book a trip. So whenever I want to book a trip, I want to book a flight, I want to book an hotel, and I want to book a car. 
So we'll focus just on this uh, trip booking function, which will use the Java FDK, and it, it's used the Flow API to basically book a flight, book an hotel, and book a car. So let's see. Uh, <laughs> So what I have here, so again, I have some payload to trigger my trip uh, function. So I'm passing that to my uh, trip function, which is running within the travel um, application. So FN list, FN travel. So if I look at this application, I have a bunch of function running, including one that is invoked at the end, email, to basically send a e confirmation email to the user. So, fn uh, invoke, this is the travel application, and we want to use the trip function. It works, it seems to work, but it's not highly visual. So, let's use this guy here. So, this is basically uh, some kind of uh, small tools that allows us to more easily and visually see what's going on. So, I will again invoke that. And you see that we have the main function that is triggered, and um, then there's this function that is invoked, that one that is invoked, that one that is invoked, and basically at the end here we are invoking another function, which is, sorry, it's, yeah, it's a serverless function that is basically the, server, the, the one that will trigger a mail. Now, the thing that is not highly user-friendly today is uh, this. So we have ju just updated the API, so this is the function ID. So basically, if you want to know what this function is today, well, you basically need to look at this, at this table to understand who is what. But that's something that we understand and we're working on to fix that. So now if we look very quickly at the code of the trip function. So uh, let's see, uh, booking uh, trip function, so it's here. So this is basically the the, just the function that we will very quickly look at. So if you have been using the completion stage or the completable feature of API of Java IC, it's basically the same API. So first we need to have an instance of a flow uh, object. So that's basically where we trigger uh, FN uh, to say, okay, I'm gonna do this uh, a function that will I likely invoke multiple remote function. And then it's just a matter of defining the different invocation that we want to do. So flight feature, we want to invoke this function, we want to invoke the hotel uh, function, and we want to invoke the car feature function. And here I'm basically defining uh, the flow between the, the different functions. So flight feature, we don't wait to have the result from flight feature, we directly invoke the flight, sorry, the hotel um, function. Once we have that, we don't wait for the result, and we are invoking the car function, but once we have done that, we need to make sure that all the functions return the result of the booking before we can send the confirmation to the, to the end user. So that is wh what the when complete method uh, is for. So it's basically, uh, first we are doing a fan out, so we're invoking multiple functions, and then here we are doing a fan in, so we basically need to wait the result of all the functions. And here email send success email is basically just, again, another invoke function to uh, set a remote serverless function that will tr send a mail to the user. So that's basically, in a nutshell, how the Flow API is working. Obviously, there is a fundamental issue with this uh, Flow here. I'm not dealing with an uh, error that will I likely happen because my functions are running on the network. That's something that um, is obviously supported by the API. I just didn't have the time to deal with all the, the exception uh, here. Well, so, but yeah, that's something that is uh, in the API. So, let's move on. We still have like two minutes. So it's time to wrap up. So we've talked about flow. There are more stuff that I, and clearly I don't have the time to discuss uh, with uh, about all the features of uh, FN today. I just want to quickly mention, for example, we are working on making sure that Java is a first class citizen uh, on FN and in the serverless space in general. So what we need to make sure is that we are trying to optimize how Java works within container. One way to do that is Graal. So Graal is basically a an open source project running at Oracle Labs that one of the aim of Graal is basically to take some Java code and produce a native uh, executable. That's something that we do support uh, in FN today. And just to give you some, uh, an idea, 
Uh, let's see. So fn list uh, Graal. I have a Graal application that is running. It has uh, three functions. Again, three times the same function. One written in Go, one written using just Java 8, and one written uh, using SVM. What is key here is that if we look at the size of the um, of those uh, image, assuming I can type. So the Java 8 one, 266 uh, megabytes. So this is uh, really uh, this is really big. 70 megabytes for the Java Graal uh, image, which is very good. And for the Golang one, just below the Graal one. So basically, with Graal, we are almost on par with a pure native uh, code. So that's something that we are uh, adding to FN and something that will bring some uh, nice benefit to the, to the platform. Then there are a bunch of other stuff that I don't have the time to discuss, like support for Spring Cloud function, uh, JAXRS support, uh, CNCF Cloud events, and so on and so on. What I just want to quickly mention is that at the beginning, I told you that you don't have to manage the platform, but still you want to have visibility of what's going on within um, your function to debug them, to understand maybe you have some bottlenecks and so on. So we are providing the hooks that allows you to do that. For example, I'm using paper trail a lot to see what's going on within my function. So in conclusion, FN is a container native. You saw that we are using Docker in and out. Now you don't necessarily need to understand Docker to use uh, FN. Cloud diagnostic, fast platform. Cloud diagnostic, so I told you that Oracle will have Oracle Cloud Function, which is based on FN, but uh, you can take FN, run it on premises, or run it, run it on a different cloud provider. There's no specific locking to any uh, vendors within FN. So I really encourage you to check uh, FN. And with that, I'd like to thank you. We are right on time. So <laughs> thank you. Just two things to remember, github.com slash FN project. Everything is there, so give it a try. The only thing that you need to have uh, installed is Docker on your machine, and you can uh, directly start to write function. And then, don't forget, fries are coming from Belgium and not from France. Thank you. <laughs> and I will be there. So if you have any questions, remark or comment, uh, feel free to come uh, there. Thanks again.